Hello, everyone. I'm Mike Simmons, president of Astronomers Without Borders, and welcome to this uh, Astrock panel, uh, part of our series for Global Astronomy Month 2013. We have a panel of distinguished artists here who have done work in space art and uh, that are going to discuss some of the things that they've done. In particular, we're focusing on some of the work that has been done by our artists um, since the space age began uh, in the 1950s with the launch of Sputnik. And we'll be uh, presenting and examining some works by these uh, artists and uh, see how they have expressed this uh, new beginning, uh, new time for the world since the launch of Sputnik. Everything changed on October 4th, 1957, when the Soviet Union successfully launched the first satellite into orbit. Uh, and with humankind gaining access into outer space for the first time in history, it really changed the way we see our planet and the way we see ourselves in relation to the universe. So I'd like to introduce the three panelists that we have. It looks like one of them may be missing on video right now, but we do have uh, Roger Molina, who is a physicist, astronomer, executive editor of Leonardo Publications at MIT Press, and a distinguished professor at the University of Texas, Dallas, and associate director of arts and technology. His work focuses on connections among digital technology, science, and art. <clears throat> We have also, uh, well, we are, are missing, it looks like, dropped out uh, Richard Klar, who's a Los Angeles new media interdisciplinary artist who now resides in Paris. And uh, Richard uh, studied at the Chouinard Art Institute, which is now Cal Arts, uh, and is an early pioneer of art and space, and began working in the field in 1982 with the NASA approved concept for an art payload for the U.S. space shuttle. And his, his works are philosophical in nature, including themes uh, for art and space projects such as space environment issues, uh, orbital debris, war and peace, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI, and water management on Earth. And finally, we also have Daniela DePaulis, who some of you may know if you've been watching these programs. Daniela is uh, the uh, Astro Art Chairman for Astronomers Without Borders and is the one behind putting together all of these panels and many other things such as the Astro Art blog going on in Astronomers Without Borders. Now, she's a visual artist and a lecturer living and working between Italy, her native country, and the Netherlands. And she works with video, installation, performance, and has been working in these areas since 2001, collaborating with others, scientists, radio, amateurs and even uh, involving some new things with uh, radio signals which are sent to the moon and picked up on the way back as part of live performances which have been a part of Global Astronomy Month before. So we're going to have short presentations by each of these artists and there will also be a way which someone else perhaps will explain for you to uh, send in questions that you have for each of these artists as well. So I'd like to turn this over now to uh, Daniela. Um, are you? Or are we starting with Roger? I'm sorry. Somebody tell me. Hi, Mike. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, the first speaker should be actually Richard, who is in Paris and uh, keeps dropping on and off. So I'm not sure whether he can actually hear us and if he can connect with us now. Otherwise, the next speaker will be Roger and then myself. But um, So, Roger, would you like to start while we wait for Richard? Um, Roger, can you hear me at all? Uh, Roger, we're not hearing you. You might... I'm sorry. I, 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 oh. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to join this discussion. Now. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. So uh, th this is a topic of great interest to me for both uh, personal and professional reasons. Uh, I'm actually a second generation uh, space uh, scientist. 
Uh, my father was a rocket scientist in the 1930s, uh, first director of the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. And so I'm very much in the, in the family, uh, family business uh, because I've worked as a space scientist for 30 years, um, both in the United States uh, and in France. But in parallel with that, I've been heavily involved with um, the art community interested in space, uh, what we now call space artists. Um, and so uh, we've uh, helped uh, artists get access to space in different kinds of ways uh, through our, our Leonardo uh, organization, but also to, to document uh, their work. And um, just as a, a framing thing for me, I think there are two two key uh, two key periods in the development of the space arts. Uh, one, of course, um, was uh, Sputnik, uh, with the first sounds from space, which I think had a huge cultural uh, impact uh, on people. Um, I, I was not really. Uh, I, aware of the impact, but I know my father's excitement uh, at the time. Uh, and of course, the, the first images from space of the Earth had a, had a very important artistic and cultural impact. But I think um, in, in, a, in a more profound way, um, we have now really become a, a space culture. And so um, the, the way I, I like to put that is if uh, we decree that tomorrow morning we would not launch any more rockets into space, well, then very quickly, uh, our society as we know it would come to a grinding halt. And so space activities are not just uh, nice things to do. They're actually a part of the way that we have designed uh, our communication systems, our Earth remote sensing systems, our disaster relief systems. Um, and and uh, so indeed, we are now a spacefaring civilization in, in a very deep and, and profound uh, way. Um, and when I talk about the work of artists uh, in the space age, um, I, I always like to talk about three different kinds of ways that artists in, are involved. One is, of course, um, by using the experience of space. Um, there are now many, many artists that have been into zero gravity, um, uh, and some of the uh, astronauts, cosmonauts, and taikonauts on their space stations have carried out um, artistic activities in space. And I just wanted to show one first example, which is a, a Spanish artist called Marceli uh, Roca. And uh, Pamela, if you can help me bring up that image. Um, do, you, do you have that now up on the screen? I can't tell what the viewers are seeing. So. Uh, yes, that's on the screen. OK, great. So that's a, a, a picture of Marceli uh, floating in zero gravity. Uh, on board the, the Russian cosmonaut training plane. And what happened was uh, an, art, an art science group in London called Arts Catalyst uh, and Leonardo submitted funding from uh, the European Union to in fact take a number of artists in, into zero gravity. And Marcelli was one of those. And what he wanted to do was to dance with his avatar. So actually what you see is, is Marcelli floating in zero gravity he built himself an exoskeleton. Uh, you can see the, the, the metal strips around his arms and legs. And then on the back screen is him floating in virtual reality. And so what he wanted to do was to literally dance with his own avatar. Uh, of course, there is no gravity uh, in, inside uh, computer uh, reality. Um, and so it was a really interesting thing to see the kinds of uh, dance vocabularies he developed but also that very intimate way that a dancer uh, experiences space. Um, and so um, as more and more artists begin to experience uh, the conditions of space, we can expect to see uh, more and more examples of truly uh, space arts uh, that are created within uh, the, the experience of space. We haven't had any um, uh, artist cosmonauts as such, but many of the, uh, the cosmonauts and astronauts have had avocations uh, as visual artists. And so they've translated their own experiences into, into uh, paintings and videos and another kind of, of self-expression. The, the second example that I like to give is uh, the way that artists um, actually have appropriated the data that comes from space from the, for their own purposes. Um, and this began very, very early on. 
Uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the early sounds from Sputnik were retranscribed and then t and included in, the, in musical performances. Um, I, I just wanted to show a couple here uh, that are of a different nature. One is the, which is now on the screen, is a, a, a work by a French artist called Pierre Comte, um, which uh, is actually a remote sensing image uh, of a part of France. And what he did was, as an artist, is he went out onto a large agricultural field and lay out uh, a number of black um, canvas tarpaulins, which, of course, because of the, the, they don't reflect sunlight, have a different temperature than the field around it. And so if you take a, an infrared picture, which is what this is from a satellite, in fact, he was drawing on the Earth. Um, and this, of course, is a very, very long tradition in the arts. There are many forms of land art everywhere on this planet uh, where artists have created very large drawings uh, on the surface of the Earth. Uh, now, of course, this is uh, probably the first examples where uh, one could see those drawings from outer space. And so, in a sense, uh, the artist has taken uh, a space instrument and reused it for his own uh, performative purposes. Uh, there's a second example of that on, on, the, on my next uh, image, which is from the American artist Tom Van Sant. Um, and if you look very carefully in the middle of this image, you can actually see the image of an eye. And what he de did with a group of, of colleagues is he laid out mirrors uh, on the, the desert floor in California in the shape of an eye. And so when the satellite looked down, you saw this eye looking back. Just a very nice, simple sort of conceptual piece that uh, subverted the use of the satellite for surveillance purposes in that case uh, and used it as a, as a symbolic uh, 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 experiment. Uh, Tom has done a huge amount of work manipulating space data. Uh, he's worked with people at, uh, at JPL extensively. And I think on my next image, um, uh, I, I show something which he did, uh, and it was sort of a very simple idea. But if you if you think back, we always have seen seen images of the spa of space with clouds and uh, weather. What he did is he actually took the the NASA data on the planet Earth and took out all the clouds, which is kind of what you look at when you see an atlas, but of course is not what a satellite sees. So he's basically uh, taking the the space data. And uh, in this case, making what, what is a very literal a map of the Earth, but is not one that you would see uh, from orbit on the International Space Station. So there are now hundreds of artists using space data for their own purposes. These are two very simple examples, uh, but we're going to see more and more of that. Just as an artist takes what they see with their eyes and makes artwork with it, so an artist can uh, take what a space instrument sees, collects, and make artwork with it. Uh, and there are many, many examples of this. The final example I want to give is just how artists use space systems. Um, and that might be rockets. Uh, in fact, there, were, there are a number of citizen science projects now which have launched artistic satellites into space. Um, the one that I'm showing here is a very early example of the use of communication satellites. It's by uh, two uh, American artists, uh, Sherry Rabinovitz and Kit Galloway who created uh, very early on in, 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 in telecommunications work uh, a project they called Hole in Space. And they did something which is so natural to us now that we don't even think about it. In fact, in this uh, Google Hangout, we're doing it. <laughs> but what they did is they connected downtown Los Angeles with downtown New York live and showed in New York on the screen what people were doing on the street in Los Angeles. And in, in Los Angeles, they showed on a screen in the street what people were doing in New York. And what, immediately what happened was people started waving to each other, talking to each other, and indeed performing for each other. And so this has now become second nature to us. But our artists were very, very early adopters of every space technology they could get their hands on. So I'm just going to finish there with that sort of brief uh, introduction. Um, and I've made it part of my professional activity to work with artists who are interested in accessing space uh, experiences, space data, or space systems. So thank you.
I'm going to mute myself. Richard, I think you're on next. Yes, Richard. Uh, uh, yes, we, we hear you. I, we've had uh, Richard uh, Klar has had a little bit of technical difficulties as these things happen. I'm Richard, still, uh, I'm, I am still having a, oops, difficulty. We're having it. Uh, uh, it keeps booting me out and 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 connecting me to my Gmail. So I'm now trying to do this on Peggy's computer. Okay. Do you do you need a few minutes? So should we go to Daniela first, or do you think you're ready? Uh, if you like, I can continue, and then yes, I, I think so, Daniela. Okay, we keep the flow. Richard will. Um, okay, before we continue, I'd like to remind the audience that uh, they can post questions and comments for any of the, uh, of the speakers. You can use the YouTube channel, the uh, Google Hangout page you are watching the event from, or Twitter, hashtag GAMAstroArt. Okay, so I will continue um, on uh, Roger's last, um, uh, well, on the, on the same trail than the uh, last picture that Roger showed, I'm very interested in uh, image uh, transmission across space. This is a part of my research. And I think uh, Sputnik is very much connected to any work that is done in this field. Uh, Sputnik was the first man-made object to be launched into space and uh, it started the era of artificial satellites. But also I think for me the Sputnik is, a, is an art object in itself. Um, its um, aesthetic qualities and its very controversial nature had a strong impact on, uh, on the, the culture uh, in those days. Uh, back in the late 50s and still now. So it has all the quality that we usually attribute to an artwork and this is why I like to, I like to consider the Sputnik, Sputnik itself uh, an art piece. So I would like to start with um, uh, one, one artist, uh, the, the first artist that used uh, image transmission across space in uh, 1969. His name is Forrest Myers. He's an American artist and uh, Pamela, I think uh, there are also some links for this presentation. Um, the Moon Museum. Okay, so Moon Museum is a small ceramic wafer, three quarters of an inch by half an inch in size, containing artworks by six prominent artists from the late 60s. This wafer was supposedly covertly attached to a leg of the intrepid landing module and subsequently left on the moon during Apollo 12. The Moon Museum is considered the first space art object. While it is impossible to tell if the Moon Museum is actually on the moon without sending another mission to look, many other personal effects were smuggled onto the, moon, uh, onto the Apollo 12 lander and hidden in the layers of gold blankets that wrapped parts of the spacecraft. In Forrest Meyer's uh, words, he, uh, his idea was to get six great artists together and make a tiny little museum that would be on the moon. The existence of the work was not revealed until Myers informed the New York Times, which ran an article on the story two days after Apollo 12 left the moon and two days before the splashdown in the Pacific Ocean. Apollo 12 was the second moon landing. It touched down November 19, 1969, crewed by Charles Conrad, Richard Gordon and Alan Bean, who has since become an artist. Okay, so uh, Forrest Myers is the first artist uh, that used image uh, traveling into outer space um, in, uh, in, uh, drawn into, onto a, a ceramic wafer. Uh, the second artist I would like to mention is John Lomberg, who is very well known both in the scientific and uh, artistic communities thanks to his collaboration uh, with scientists for documentaries, films and uh, artworks. 
John Lomberg has produced some of the most unusual, durable, and far-flung images ever created by the human species. In 1977, he was design director for NASA's famous Voyager Interstellar Record, sent beyond the solar system on a robot spacecraft. His cover art for that project predicted to last for over a thousand million years, one of the uh, long-lasting uh, human art. Uh, well, one of the longest lived pieces of human art. Uh, we, we will see soon that there is one artwork that will last even longer than uh, John Lomberg's artwork. What is interesting about this piece is, of course, the relation that the artists create with the duration of the, of the art piece itself, but also uh, the choice of the images that uh, John Lomberg and uh, Carl Sagan made they uh, encrypted onto, this, uh, onto the uh, phonograph records images from uh, different scenes on Earth uh, depicting different cultures, uh, daily uh, life scenes from different parts of the Earth, different landscapes, natural and architectural. However, they, uh, their aim was not to uh, give any political or uh, historical meaning to those pictures in case they will ever be encountered by uh, an alien civilization. So this artwork is very different from the one that I will mention in a few minutes. And to finish the description about John Lomberg's work, I would like also to mention four art objects that uh, John Lomberg helped design in for uh, and that are now on Mars. Uh, uh, it's three sundials aboard Spirit, Opportunity, and the Curiosity rovers, and a DVD Visions of Mars, which is aboard the Phoenix lander. So again, in uh, John Lomber's work, we see uh, images traveling into other space and encrypted onto these golden records or onto other uh, physical support. Uh, the relation with the Sputnik, I think, is quite um, evident in these works. Um, again, it's man-made objects that are launched into space, and several other artists are working with this, with this idea nowadays. However, these were the real pioneers um, of this kind of art. In um, very, uh, very recently, in 2012, Trevor Paglan also launched another artwork into space containing images, 100 images, and this project is called The Last Pictures. Since 1963, more than 800 spacecraft have been launched into geosynchron geosynchronous orbit, forming a man-made ring of satellites around the Earth. These satellites are destined to become the longest lasting artifacts of human civilization, quietly floating through space, long after every trace of humanity has disappeared from the planet. Trevor Pegland's The Last Pictures is a project that marks one of these spacecraft with a visual record of our contemporary historical moment. Pegland spent five years interviewing scientists, artists, anthropologists, and philosophers to consider what such a cultural mark should be. Working with material scientists at, uh, at the MIT, Pegland developed an artifact designed to last billions of years, an ultra-archival disk, micro-edged with 100 photographs and encased in a gold-plated shell. In fall 2012, the communication satellite EcoStar-16 launched into geostationary orbit with the disk mounted to its, to its anti-Earth deck. While the satellite's broadcast images are as fleeting as the light speed radio waves they travel on, the last pictures will remain in outer space, slowly circling the Earth until the Earth itself is no more. Again, I find really interesting this relation between the physical object launching to space and uh, time. In the case of uh, Trevor Pegland's uh, artwork, uh, the, the art piece itself is uh, designed to outlive the Earth itself. And while speaking about this art, uh, artwork with uh, Trevor Pegland, uh, I found out that uh, his aim was not so much um, the that these pictures will ever be found by an alien civilization, 
that the fact that these pictures are somehow um, collective and conscious that is uh, circling the earth until the end of days. So the, uh, the, the images are very controversial, are really uh, portraying some of, the, some of the most painful parts in history of uh, humankind. So very different from what um, uh, John Lomberg and uh, Carl Sagan did in the past. But um, I, I think it's very interesting the way uh, Peglan connects uh, this uh, space artwork to the uh, history of humankind. I think it's a, a, a remarkable artist. I would like to continue also uh, talking about other kinds of image transmission, which uh, happen uh, through radio waves, not uh, through. Um, physical support, like in the case of artworks we've seen so far. Uh, I would like to mention my research on visual moon bounds, which um, I've been uh, developing since 2009. I pioneered a new application of uh, the moon bounce technology, which is a, a technology developed after the Second World War. Actually, quite interesting, moon bounce was the very first step of the space race. So it kind of, it, it, it was before the Sputnik, the, the, what really started the space race. Moon bounce was designed as an espionage tool by the US Navy to listen to uh, hidden uh, Morse code and radio messages coming from the Soviet Union. And it was used until the artificial satellites were deployed. So its history is quite controversial, but also strongly linked to the history of the Sputnik. And in 2009, uh, together with a team of radio amateurs at the Dwingelo Radio Telescope in the Netherlands, I developed uh, an application of, uh, of this technology that allows to transmit images into outer space and to bounce them off the moon's surface. I apply this particular technology to a live performance which is called Optics, during which images submitted by the public are uh, sent to the moon and back. And because the moon surface is a very bad reflector and uh, it, uh, the radio waves that its, uh, its surface are scattered all around the space, so this, these radio waves are still traveling into other space while we speak. And uh, I guess that uh, I'm very interested in um, the fleeting uh, quality of these uh, visual messages, this visual data, um, quite the opposite to what uh, Trevor Palin is trying to do. Uh, he, he's trying to uh, um, convey images into other space that are uh, lasting uh, as long as the Earth. And I'm fascinated by the idea of um, uh, the possibility of uh, sending to other space these very fragile messages. And I would like to conclude this uh, short presentation by also introducing what, in my opinion, um, could be the art of the future. Uh, I'm referring to the images that have been um, sent recently back from the surface of Mars by the uh, Curiosity rover. And in particular, one image uh, that shows a hole created by the, the rover onto the Mars soil. And uh, I think that image is incredibly uh, interesting. And uh, it has, again, uh, the quality that we know will normally attribute to an artwork, to a man-made artwork. Uh, it's aesthetic quality and also conceptual and um, and, um, of course, the, the image is destined to change the way we perceive our presence in the solar system. Uh, also, uh, the, the images that the rover is sending back from Mars are uh, itself incredibly fascinating because uh, we often see uh, this rover portraying itself into the landscape. So the viewer is immediately drawn to make a link between the machine and itself. It can, uh, he or she can imagine him or herself in, on, on Mars uh, and uh, creating this kind of symbiosis with the machine. So the whole concept of embodiment, I think, uh, it's a challenge 
completely by these images that we receive, uh, we receive by the um, this is this machine exploring other planets. And again, we're talking about uh, radio waves transmission. So uh, I think this is a, a kind of uh, image transmission that is particularly interesting to me. And uh, so to conclude my presentation, I think the point was to also uh, raise the question of uh, man-made art and machine-made art. So the, again, the uh, Sputnik is very much, in my opinion, an artist itself as much as this uh, machine of the future um, perhaps will be. Okay, I, I, will, I think we can move on to Richard. Uh, Richard, you are there mm -hmm. now. Yes, I'm here. Excellent. Okay, uh, I'm sorry for, I was having difficulty uh, connecting to the website, so I had to switch computers and now I'm here. So I missed uh, most of Roger's presentation, but I did hear yours, Daniela. And I guess I'd like to begin with, I, I think everyone mentioned, well, the people who witnessed Sputnik, myself included, uh, October 4th, 1957, I stood in the backyard with my parents in East Hollywood, and we looked up at the night sky and saw this uh, pinpoint of light moving across the sky. And I would have to say that at that moment, I knew for certainty that uh, I wanted to be a cowboy because uh, astronauts weren't an option then. But s seriously, uh, seeing Sputnik, uh, I would have to say if there was a feeling, I mean, there definitely was a feeling, but I think that it was more of an ominous feeling because we didn't, meaning my parents, myself, and I think most people, if you weren't connected to the industry, uh, we didn't know what it meant or what it portrayed, but it seemed to have some kind of a ominous feeling, like something was watching us. But it, would, it definitely planted a seed as far as I'm concerned, and it was one of those seeds that germinated for 20-some years before I myself became interested in art and, and, and space and art. But I think the main thing was that there was never any opportunity or there didn't appear to be any opportunity for the average person to be able to access space. So I want to talk about uh, three artists today, one who I consider to be the pioneer of space art. When I say that, I mean art in space. And uh, that's Joseph McShane. He's an Arizona-based artist, and he's referred to in NASA's own lit literature as the world's quote-unquote, first space artist. And McShane created an artwork in 1984 in the cargo bay of the U.S. Space Shuttle Challenger as part of NASA's Getaway Special Program. And if we could have the first slide, number one, which is a, a view of two Getaway Special Canisters. Yes, there we see it. Uh, those are five cubic foot canisters. And... Uh, each one of the canisters is self-contained, meaning it has to have its own power supply. It has to have everything inside of it. The only service that NASA provided was an astronaut would activate a switch that turned the experiment inside the canister on and off. If we could have the next uh, number two, that's the URL for a Wikipedia. No, it's number two is a uh, Wikipedia for getaway specials. Okay, uh, so the... Uh, Sorry, we don't have that one. Okay, I sent it to you with my list. Okay, the uh, Getaway Special Program utilized five cubic foot self-contained canister carried in the cargo bay of the space shuttle on a space available basis and were available to individuals or institutions anywhere in the world. And this was quite unique because really anyone who had uh, an experiment they wanted to fly would have access. The basic cost for the payload was $10,000. Then there were options available like a motorized door assembly and ejection mechanism, which would allow you to uh, eject a small satellite out into space. So what strict criterion for 
the gas program was that the payload had to be justified in terms of human or technical benefit. McShane's gas payload G038 consisted uh, of eight small glass spheres that were co color coded by vacuum deposition of different metals using, among other things, the natural vacuum of space. If we could have slide number three. That's. Okay, that's uh, Joseph McShane pictured with, you, you can't see all of the uh, small spheres, but there were eight small spheres and then one large sphere in the center. So each of the smaller glass spheres had a different metal with uh, an electrode that heated or melted the metals inside the sphere. And then the natural vacuum of space created a, a vacuum deposition. So the difference between doing this on Earth was that the perfect vacuum of space created a, a much more even coating than you could do on Earth. And also the fact that there was no gravity uh, affected to the way the uh, vaporization occurred on the, on the spheres. So uh, if we can go to the next slide, a ninth larger glass sphere, which we'll see in a, in a minute, uh, yes, had a valve, which you can see sort of in the upper left-hand corner of the globe, uh, had a valve that allowed the sphere to be evacuated in space by the vacuum and then closed before returning to Earth, thereby returning an actual sample of the space environment. And so that in itself was a kind of a sculpture returning the space environment uh, back to Earth. And uh, one thing that these, there were four artists that were involved in the Getaway Special Program, and the four artists that had payloads approved and accepted by NASA. I was one of the artists. Uh, the, the Getaway Special Program was announced by NASA in 1976. In 1977, Joseph McShane had the first payload accepted in 1977. Joe Davis had the second payload accepted in 1982. I had the third payload accepted in 1982. And Al Wunderlich had the, from Rhode Island School of Design had the fourth payload accepted in 1984. And one thing that, that all of these payloads shared in common was that they were all technologically feasible and all within reasonable cost, meaning that they were going to cost millions of dollars if it would cost, they were expensive, but still it was a way that uh, these experiments could have been performed in space. Uh, in my case, after the Challenger accident in 1986, the uh, uh, eject ejection mechanisms and opening door assemblies were no longer available, so that put an end to spaceflight dolphin flying on the shuttle. However, spaceflight dolphin is still a valid concept and there seems to be renewed interest and now it looks like there could be possibilities for spaceflight dolphin to fly on uh, another launch field vehicle, perhaps with a private company such as, uh, for example, XCOR in Palmdale, California. So the next artist that I would like to speak about Oh, by the way, I'm, I'm sorry that uh, Joseph McShane does not have a website, so there's very little material that can be found on him. You can Google and he might come up with a few tidbits. He's written up in some of the NASA literature, but there's really not a whole lot available about him. So the, uh, the next artist I would like to mention is uh, Carrie Patterson, a Los Angeles-based artist, and she's been conducting uh, experimental spatial practice and visual art since 1983 with an emphasis on the fertile nexus between the disciplines of science, art, and engineering. Her work is conceptual, often interdisciplinary, and collaborative, and comprises multi-sensory artworks, installation, performance, text, and drawing. She has spent years experimenting with uncommon materials, innovating forms, tinkering with machines, 
in making what can best be described as pataphysical models, as in Alfred Jerry's Science of Imaginary Solutions. Uh, could we have slide number five, please? That's the URL for uh, the free enterprise show that featured her work and has a complete description. No, it was the uh, slide five was a. Uh, oh, we don't URL. have that. I'm sorry. Okay, so if you can show this, the next slides, the next four slides, if you could just show them in succession, about six seconds each. Okay, this this is the uh, homesickness kit, and uh, there are different segments that open up, and each segment is filled with beeswax and a different different. Uh, fragrance. So Patterson's current work combines horticulture, perfume product design, and organic chemistry with the study of the cultural impacts of human use and imagination about outer space. Her unique scientific glass works, which double as functional perfume bottles and were developed in 2007 and 2010 in collaboration with glass blower Bob Maiden, are models for the concentric relationships in the universe at both a macro and micro level. This can be observed in the way the physical structure of the solar system and atoms also reflect human consciousness and how the embodied mind experiences the world, mind within body, body within society, society within world, and world within the onworld. Patterson's home sickness kits are being developed to mitigate the psychological and physiological discomfort of space travel with time sent journeys for both the space tourist and astronaut. And if we could show slide number 10, that's the URL for the uh, Vimeo home sickness video. We, we didn't get your list of, of URLs at all, I'm sorry. I'll add those to the show notes after the end of the show. Okay. Uh, home sickness kits are designed to counteract feelings of unease, panic, or claustrophobia with scent memory triggers related to important plants on Earth. These palliatives can be custom tailored to passengers on suborbital flights or come as standard offerings to all passengers, much like air sick bags are provided on all airlines. According to Patterson's research on longer trips, this kind of environmental engineering may have implications for astronauts' health, performance, and social relationship. And I, I think that uh, I could see how this particular design with something that you, this small you hold in your hand is physically attractive and offers certain comforts to you, I, I think that you could become very easily attached to this and look forward for, uh, look towards it for comfort. So um, when the sites are eventually posted for, for um, uh, Carrie Patterson and the links to her Vimeo, then you'll be able to read about this in more detail. And I apologize for not having enough time to present this in, as fully as it was presented uh, uh, on her website. So the last artist that I'd like to discuss is uh, Christian Waldvogel, who lives in Zurich, Switzerland, and works as an artist, architect, author, and programmer. He views himself as a conceptual artist that deals with humanity as a species on a planet and in the universe. He believes that understanding the world as such, that having a real sense of its properties and character as a, as a sphere orbiting a star, enables us to achieve the sense of context necessary to become truly global citizens. In this respect, he creates projects that encourage people to look at life from, out, from an outside perspective with a critical distance. 
in 2010, Christian Wallvogel created The Earth Turns Without Me. Uh, do you have slide 11? That's, that's also a URL for Christian Vogels. No. Okay. In this project, the Earth's rotation was canceled by traveling westward across the Alps at a speed at which the Earth turns in Switzerland, 1,158 kilometers an hour. He worked with the Swiss Air Force flying in a two-seated Tiger F-5F fighter jet. While the Earth was turning from Glarus to Lucerne, so to speak, the plane did not turn along. By covering the entire, oh, and one thing I'll add that he actually went a little bit faster than that because of the uh, jet stream. I think he had to fly over 1,300 kilometers per hour. Um, by covering the entire inside of the rear canopy where Wall Vogel sat with the red filter gel, except for a very small window that was precisely located inside the cockpit, the rear cockpit was transformed into uh, a pinhole camera. This allowed Wall Vogel to expose the film for four minutes to the light from the sun coming in through the pinhole which resulted in a picture of the sun as a single point that is documented in a photographic print. Uh, Wald Vogel would thus, from the perspective of the sun, stand still and uh, would thus, from the perspective of the sun, stand still and this is what can be seen in the video of the earth as it turns. And that's another slide with the URL, which I'm going to guess you don't have. Slide 12? No. Okay. When the plane landed on the ground, it, it was uh, oriented at the same angle as it was during flight, and another four-minute exposure was taken of the sun through the pinhole, which resulted in an image of the sun as a streak of light rather than a pinpoint. And it was really, you know, quite sort of a, a, a simple concept, but yet a very strong concept, and I think it was very moving. And I would say that uh, the three artists that I talk about, I think that all of their work falls under the category of process art, where the process of creating the art is as important, if not the final statement itself. So. You can't separate the process from the work that was created. So unlike creating a painting or a sculpture, or the final, final product is, is the artwork, the process in creating these three works that I just spoke about were part of, um, part of the process and part of the artwork itself. And just last, I'll say a quick something about um, one of my more recent project called Collision 2, uh, uh, an orbiting constellation sculpture from orbital debris. And this was a piece that I created, uh, this actually was the second one, in 2003. I worked with uh, the Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, D.C., and I worked with a French composer in Paris, Marc Gattier, and uh, I from the then orbital debris catalog, which was uh, about then 13,000 objects, objects ranging in size from 10 centimeters up to large rocket bodies and various fragments of uh, rockets and satellites, I selected uh, 192 objects. And I did this sort of in the classical sense. I looked at all that debris as you would a block of marble, a block of stone. And I said to the Naval Research Laboratory, I created certain parameters. I said that I wanted to take all objects that fell outside these parameters between 96 and 104 degrees inclination and between uh, 350 and 800 uh, kilometers. I wanted to eliminate everything that fell outside those parameters. And what was left was 192 objects, which the Naval Research Laboratory created a simulation of these objects color-coded by country of origin, first set against all 13,000 objects and then just the objects themselves as they orbited the Earth as viewed out from geosynchronous orbit. 
and the composer that I worked with created a musical score using some of the uh, data from the two-line element sets that, that describes the orbits of these pieces. So it, it was uh, a way of calling attention to this problem of orbital debris. It's a very serious problem, certainly one that has not gotten any better, and, and if anything, it's gotten worse. And there really doesn't appear to be uh, any easy solutions to mitigate this problem. So you can find out about that on my website, which is underneath my name, arttechnologies.com. Under projects, you can read about Collision 2 and some of the other projects that I've been involved with. So I'm happy to have participated in this panel and look forward to uh, any discussion that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Daniela, if I may, I'll uh, uh, see. First of all, we don't have any questions coming from the audience yet, but don't forget that if you're watching and you want to ask a question with the short time we have remaining, um, we, you can tweet them to hashtag GAM, G-A-M, AstroArt, or, or comment in the boxes on the event page on Google Plus or on YouTube. Going back to the beginning, <clears throat> and having been someone who also was aware of Sputnik when I was very young, I'm interested in the idea of something that, that I notice is kind of a theme here, that we, many different movies and books and stories talk about the idea of our art going into space in some way. Sputnik really sort of increased our living space, uh, our, our reach. But there are many, many things in which we talk about um, uh, things like Voyager with the plaques on there, uh, reaching out to other places, also some works that were mentioned, I think, by Roger, uh, extending art out into the universe, uh, not necessarily for someone else to find, but for the idea that space is eternal and in a way this this makes humanity eternal long after we may be gone and the earth is gone they'll still be there and it strikes me that this is sort of a common theme that's developed since Sputnik many programs uh, movies contact uh, the books and Star Trek and and many other ideas but in a way there there seem to be two perspectives here on this. There is the scientific, such as Curiosity and Voyager, and there is the artistic, such as what's also on Voyager and what seems to come from, from Curiosity as well. Are, are these two expressions of really the same thing, some longing in humanity to uh, sort of a philosophical nature that's developed since we've reached out into space? It, it, it's, I wonder if uh, someone would want to comment on I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in, I guess. Um, it, it seems to me, I mean, to, to the extent that um, over all of human history, the appropriation of new geographic spaces and now outer space is really part of a continuous sort of cultural appropriation process. Um, and indeed, you know, part of that is um, marking of, of places. Um, and so indeed, I, I think that's a very powerful thing that people do through various kinds of objects they make and traces they leave, trace making. Um, and, and so, you know, I think what's interesting now is you know, clearly space is not just beyond the atmosphere and a little bit different, it's really different <laughs> as, the, as we know. And so I think we're still struggling um, with whether space is is our new home or whether it's really such an extreme and foreign environment that we will never really be able to to live there and so I think this sort of a conflicting cultural uh, exploring going on at the moment Richard did you have anything you uh, wanted to mention as well well, I just, uh, you mentioned looking at curiosity, and, and I think Daniela referred to 
drilling the hole on the moon and and uh, even though you could say that curiosity is pure science it it's it is still art in a way and it, the old uh, Bauhaus adage that form follows function that these these things curiosity is a work of art in and of itself as was uh, Sputnik and you know, I, I hearken back to a, a show that was very controversial at the Guggenheim that was done on motorcycles a few years back, and people were in, were outraged that you could put motorcycles in a museum and call it art. Well, the, the what we're talking about is the context that the museum provided the context, and you took the motorcycles off the street or wherever they were, and you put them in the museum, and it provided a different context of how to view them. So I think that that's sort of what the artist or some of the artists involved with today is providing a different context of how to view things. So we use technology, we use data, we combine scientific principles and we create art and we make statements about what we're involved with, what we're passionate about. And I think um, another thing, is I think that part of space art and part of the function is, and particularly I have an interest in in uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and how art can be used for extraterrestrial messages and and, and interested particularly in nonverbal communication. And these, while being attempts at communication for extraterrestrial intelligence, they're also attempts to communicate with people on Earth their forms, they have the potential to raise people's consciousness. If you read something or hear something about somebody sending a message, well, it, it's something that people can discuss on Earth and it can change the way they look at things, the way they look at space, the way they look at life, the way they look at the meaning of life, and the way they look at what the potential is for life in the universe, life elsewhere. I'd like to add uh, something to this. Oh, it's getting really dark here, so okay, I hope you can still see me. Um, yes, this concept of technology, I think it's uh, very often uh, somehow misleading in the art discourse because also the paintbrush and the uh, easel are technology. So. Uh, if we cons if we think of these machines like the uh, Curiosity rover as um, man-made and also as uh, objects that are still somehow uh, remotely controlled by humans, uh, we can see uh, uh, the cultural uh, aspect that in it's inbuilt in them. So the fact that this Curiosity rover uh, drilled a hole in the on the Mars uh, surface. It's very much a human, um, uh, the, the, the extension of the human will and uh, whether the, the person or the group of people who dictated the action is a scientist or an artist, that doesn't make much of a difference because in a way that is really the first sculpture to be ever built on a, on a planet um, outside Earth. So I guess that uh, also in the future maybe artists might be interested in uh, working in that direction and uh, I'm personally interested in uh, the potential of these uh, rovers and uh, machines sent into other space for extending somehow the uh, uh, cultural uh, ambition or uh, curiosity of humankind whether that might be an artist or a scientist or anyone really um, who is interested in engaging with these um, concepts. So I think that's a fascinating direction. And um, so uh, science and art are very often um, working uh, in the same uh, path, uh, that, uh, which is research. And um, yes, I guess that's, that's what I... Uh, I'm not sure whether that this answer your question, Mike. I'd like to maybe uh, uh, bounce off both of those things. Um, um, Richard made a comment about the, the process itself being a part of the artistic work. Um, and, I, and I think um, also in, in, in terms of Daniela's comment, you know, the, the, 
The art museum is a very recent invention and maybe they will disappear. Um, what isn't a recent invention is humans' propensity for making artifacts of all kinds. Uh, and artifact making seems to be part of, of a very basic thing that human beings do, um, some of which uh, obviously are deployed for certain kinds of uh, strategies and others. Uh, and, and of course, many, you know, many artifacts that are now in art museums were created thousands of years ago for purposes that had nothing to do with art making. They, they were part of uh, making artifacts to make sense of the world, to try and control the world, to, to create images of the world. Mm -hmm. And so the, there really is a continuity uh, between the kind of artifacts that people make. Um, and I, I think this, this putting of things in, in the art box or the science box is a very dangerous idea, and uh, uh, you know C.P. Snow, who I think did humanity a very big disservice by creating this meme about the two cultures. Because if you go back thousands of years, you find human beings in their habitations creating all kinds of artifacts. Um, some of those are, are to shape the buildings they live in. Some of them to shape the clothing, the clothing they wear. Some of them are objects that have religious or ritual importance, and some of them are, have to do with just trying to make sense of the world. And so I think as we look at the, the work of space artists, we need to look at that in the continuity uh, totally, and, and that, that's what Daniela said that I'm resonating to, it's a total continuity of what scientists and engineers are doing, or people whose paychecks come to, to those kind of institutions. And so. No, I think uh, it's really important to look at the work of art, ma art makers today as part of this continuity of, of artifact making. Interesting. Well, thank you all. I, I think that for those of us in astronomy, we feel we have some of the most difficult questions to answer. Things like, like where does the universe come from and where will it end? Uh, but I think we can add to that one question that uh, we, we often hear has probably been throughout time as well, which is what is art? Um, and, and it sounds to me like there isn't any definitive answer. It's technology, it's science, it's, it's all really part of one thing. I think during the Astra Art program that has developed under Daniela's uh, management in Astronomers Without Borders, which is not something that we envisioned at the beginning, uh, has been fascinating because there do tend to be different communities, uh, sort of people speaking different languages, whether it's from one perspective of technology, engineering, science, or art, or philosophy. And we find with things such as astro poetry and and so on that uh, we're 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 talking the same thing. Sometimes talking past each other, but talking about the same thing. These larger questions as well. So that's what I, I find fascinating about this in, in the ongoing program. Um, some of the things, too, have to do with actually humans in space or reaching out to space. In Daniela's case, it is sending images that we have created here on Earth into space to the moon and receiving them back here, in which case there's a, a physical contact. But also uh, some uh, artwork that was pointed out uh, that simply back on Earth as viewed from space. And we have uh, uh, astronauts in space on the International Space Station. There are s some, uh, Chris Hadfield in particular is now the commander of uh, ISS, a, a Canadian astronaut, uh, tweets almost constantly uh, throughout his day when he gets a chance because they're very busy. But he sends pictures that he takes. And these are fantastic, not only is expressions of nature and human uh, technology, with, such as cities and lights at night, uh, they, they appear like artwork to me. So uh, I think there's a, a real interaction there. And the artificial lines, such as in Astronomers Without Borders, we sort of try to go past geographic borders, but we're finding that these other borders are being broken down as, as well. And maybe they always have been, but it seems that what panels is saying is that they've always been artificial borders to begin with. Is that uh, 
Do you, do you think I'm on track as far as that goes? Do you agree with that idea? I would agree. Yeah, I, I would agree, but but, I, but also I would um, emphasize that indeed, uh, it, it it you know something has different different has happened in the last fifty years because you know astronomy uh, I think itself has changed uh, because of the space age so fundamentally, not only because we can now actually go visit things that we could only see remotely before. Um, but but also um, just the way that uh, we now have access to the whole electromagnetic spectrum and so on and so th the, these philosophical questions that for thousands of years um, we were faced with just looking at the night sky and trying to figure out some of these big questions um, have, have now um, become so accessible to obviously robotic exploration uh, which changes astronomy fundamentally but also the way now we have telescopes that look at x-rays, at uh, infrared waves, everything else you can imagine. And, um, and so th that, that philosophical impact of the space age, uh, not only first on astronomy, I think, uh, but then through the new, the new kind of astronomy that we're doing on how we see our place in the universe and so on. It, it's, it really is a major transition the people 50,000 years from now will look back at uh, as a very major uh, change in, in human culture. Well, I, I would add to that as well, too, that just the opportunity to look back at the Earth and see the Earth from space has given us a new perspective on our planet, but also a place in our universe. We, we had uh, earlier on the movie Overview by the Overview Institute aired on one of these hangouts with uh, astronauts who had had that experience and it's based on the overview effect which is one that uh, astronauts have when they see the earth from above and it's not just that the earth is seen without the our artificial borders but that it's seen as a planet among the stars it's something we've known but it's quite a bit different when you experience it and so it's this, this space age has given us a new sense of where we live, what, uh, who we are as well, that I think a lot of this uh, addresses as well. It helps to blur the lines quite a bit. And uh, astronomy, but many other things have changed as a result of that. I, I think that it'll be interesting when the first poet goes into space, somebody who uses words as a tool and is able to express themselves in a poetic way. I remember seeing years ago, back in the 80s, some just the standard footage from the space shuttle of two astronauts doing an EVA as they were circling the Earth. And the film ran for you know, over an hour, so you saw a sunrise, you saw a sunset. And these things were happening while the guys were talking about, uh, can you hand me that wrench, or I need a 5 sixteenths bolt over here. But then they would just kind of stop and turn and look at this, you know, incredible sunrise or sunset, and they were so moved by what they saw, but you know, they really weren't able to express themselves, let's say, the way a poet or a writer might do it. So I think that and that day probably isn't far away when we see someone like that in space. Well, let me just add to that comment on on the overview effect. I think you're absolutely right, um, and and of course we all know at the time of Galileo how how things changed once people understood you know there were th mountains on the moon, right? I mean these very simple things mm -hmm. that the telescope did uh, at the time of, of uh, the Renaissance and so on had these very deep cultural and, uh, and, and philosophical implications. And so similarly, I think with the overview effect, um, we're kind of living in the middle of it still at the moment. Um, and maybe 100 years from now, 200 years from now, we'll look back at the kind of art making going on now and understand what is an appropriate art for the, for the space age. And it takes a long time for people to wrestle with these very big changes in, 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 their, in their perception of things. Um, I mean, Galileo didn't realize what he was doing, you know, and, and I think similarly, 
uh, those first photographs taken from space um, were, were sort of seen as illustrations, but as you as, as you just articulated, um, it, it really it makes something so real that until then has kind of been conceptual, and um, and so I, I, it's going to take I think many decades before we know what kind of really cultural expression, what kind of artwork will, will be generated. And as, as Richard just said, that also means that um, hopefully the people who are spending time in space will ha will spend time <laughs> making art also. Well, it's it's interesting too that you mentioned that because <laughs> some of the pictures that were first taken, uh, of course, were fascinating to us. But the first astronauts to go into space were they didn't know what to expect, frankly, uh, and. And it's true that they haven't really been able to express what they experienced for the most part. And many express fr frustration at that. And the Overview Institute is trying to sort of bring that that experience to people through simulations and so on. But, it, you know, it's very difficult. Uh, I forget which one it was. One of the Apollo astronauts who went to the moon, I don't remember if he, he landed on it, maybe someone else remember who it was, that they they sort of knew what to expect from the moon but what surprised them what they weren't prepared for was looking back at earth and seeing it the way it really was from space from the outside and he said that we came all this way to the moon and what we really discovered is the earth uh, in a new way of understanding it so uh, I, that's certainly clear that and we'll have people, uh, average citizen, uh, maybe not average, those with plenty of money, going into space uh, on a more regular basis. And, and hopefully some of those who do in the not too distant future will be able to express these things to us as well. Um, we have uh, one question from Ari Nguyen. I'm sorry if I don't pronounce that right. Regarding the overview effect, do you think it's possible to transfer this effect to the people on the ground, can this uh, can art be a kind of transmission to implement this effect to us? Uh, <clears throat> since I'm part of the Inst Overview Institute effort, I can say that what's being applied to it right now is largely technology, but the technology is similar to what's used in uh, movie making. Uh, in fact, Doug Trumbull, one of the uh, premier special effects artists, is involved as well. So it's the technology being applied, but I, I guess one could argue that that technology has been developed for the purpose of art. It's for movies and everything else. So that is what's what's happening um, with attempts to bring the overview effect to um, those of us down here who will probably never make it into space ourselves. Uh, does anyone else have a, a comment yeah, on I'll, that? I'll jump, I'll jump in on that. Um, in, con in cultural circles, there's what's called embodied knowledge, and I, th I think it, you know it is. I think that's what happened to the astronauts on the moon. Suddenly, they knew something physically that they had known intellectually, right? And that there's something about actually inhabiting a different environment, uh, moving around in it. Uh, obviously, they didn't smell the moon, <laughs> but they certainly were able to touch the moon. But there is something about the way the brain works um, where knowledge that you get that involves embodied activity, uh, moving your head, uh, closing your ears, blinking, um, that gives you that, that uh, very uh, strong um, sense of, I mean, I guess empathy would be the, would be the wrong word, but, but that, that somehow you're, you're one with that, that knowledge. Um, psychologists talk of the gestalt switch, uh, where you see things a certain way and then suddenly something happens and you can no longer see it the same way. And so I think one of the hope would be that, that some of the work of, of artists would indeed be able to take that overview effect and somehow allow people that haven't experienced it uh, to, to somehow share it in a, in, a, in a deep and intimate sense. Um, and uh, that's where I think some of the artists work with uh, with virtual reality system or even some of the uh, some of the very sophisticated now 
heads up gaming systems and so on where you can semi experience uh, these other you know it, it's so hard to imagine what gravity is like when it's just a sixth of the value we have on earth I mean conceptually you understand it <laughs> but there's no doubt when the astronauts started walking around the moon and swinging golf clubs I mean that was real <laughs> and so how you understand one-sixth gravity uh, except by embodied uh, knowledge is very hard to imagine and I think um, you know we would hope that the work of artists would help uh, have that overview effect becoming become embodied but just looking at the way people struggle with understanding global ch climate change people don't want to understand <laughs> they don't understand deeply of how interconnected the planet is as a single system and uh, conceptually we all understand that it's one one atmosphere <laughs> but until you look at it from the outside um, it's not not as real <laughs> I'd yes. like to add I'd like to add oh. something too okay. do you want to go here, Danielle? It's, a... it's it's fine you continue Richard I, yes. I will okay. no just just in sitting here and hearing this conversation about the overview effect and how that could be communicated or done in such a way that people on earth could experience uh, what I think of would be what I would do as an artist is I would build an isolation tank you know a tank that's filled with a highly saline solution of water that enables someone to float very easily without any effort and keeping their head and their ears above the water line and I would have a dome over this tank and of course it would be dark inside the tank you would go into the tank naked without any clothes uh, and then onto this dome the dome would be translucent and you would project on the outside of this dome the overview effect you would see you could see part of the surface of the moon and you could see the earth as it's rising above the surface of the moon so you would have a sensation of floating in space while seeing this overview effect so you would have two sensory experiences at least well, I, I would and, like uh, to add sorry Mike just um, sorry, go ahead Dan. I would like sure. to add to uh, Roger, Roger and Richard uh, about the educational possibilities potential of art in a way uh, personally I, I think art and education um, also um, have not always the same purpose so um, I think in the case of the overview, overview effect is more a matter of um, not wanting to understand because um, we have the cultural and scientific knowledge about the earth being part of a much bigger system so I think there is um, almost a, a, a well a delay of in understanding that, in understanding the bigger picture, but I think it's more cultural than experiential. And I think uh, education should really try to fill these uh, these gaps um, since very early age. So um, children should be uh, thought that uh, we are borrowing this planet from a much bigger system. And I think, uh, of course, ex experiencing that even we virtual reality might help but I think it's more of a cultural uh, shift um, and I think uh, art uh, should be also allowed to question all the um, well contradictory aspect of uh, this cultural shift and the uh, all the much deeper uh, questions that uh, this um, cultural shift might uh, lead to in a way yeah, so, you know, it seems to me, and, I'll, and when I'm talking about art with these uh, uh, well-known artists, I'll always say it seems to me because I'm not the authority here, but that art is really quite often about breaking paradigms. Uh, education largely consists of imparting prior knowledge, not always about, uh, in most cultures, about teaching to see things differently but but 
infusing the existing, but art, uh, for example, Richard's uh, dolphin in space. Well, we have dolphins, we have representations of dolphins. We, we haven't seen them in space before, you know? So it seems to me that that's just a, a way of sort of breaking the paradigm, of, of breaking the, uh, the our, our sort of inner concepts, our world view, and, and presenting things in another way that, that generates new feelings. Is, can you say, Richard, that that yes. perhaps is what... Mm -hmm. I, 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 go, ahead, go ahead, Richard. No, I'm just going to say that, you know, as far back to the dolphin, space flight dolphins, it's, it's interesting that it's a very iconic symbol that everyone understands that. At the show that just recently finished at UC Riverside Free Enterprise, they built a full-scale mock-up of space flight dolphin, and it was very interesting to watch children's reactions, people rea people's reactions. They got right away what the concept was. It needed very little explanation. Oh, yeah, dolphin in space, sure sending dolphin voices into space. It didn't, at least to many people, it didn't seem like a foreign idea. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to um, re-inject something. Um, sometimes when I talk to people, and I, th I think this is you know, where, you, where the, you make the difference between education and, and maybe what artistic exploration might be, um, people actually sometimes have the feeling that going to space is like going to Antarctica, but it's a bit further. <laughs> Um, and, the, and it's actually not further, depending on how high you go. But, um, but in fact, you know, we forget how finely tuned we as human beings are to the environment on Earth. Um, you know, the whole human species has evolved in one gravity, in a, a very specific kind of atmosphere, with, with all the sensory uh, inputs and experiences that we have. You know, when we go into space, we are the aliens. I mean, we, we're not, we were not, we did not involve in that space environment. You know, cosmic rays are dangerous for us. Uh, if we don't have gravity, we get lost. We don't, we don't know how to orient ourselves. And so, um, you know, I, 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 th I think, um, uh, you know, part of the change of paradigm really is, is trying to imagine <laughs> what it would be like to, to, to be like to live in space. And obviously the people who've been there have had these transformative experiences, the overview effect and so on. But, but when we start having people who are born in space, <laughs> who knows? Who knows how that, you know, what, what kind of art making they'll imagine. And uh, you know, that's probably a long way away from now, unfortunately. Um, so, so space, you know, we, we are aliens in space. And so how how we create space art uh, for people who live in space is, is, is going to be a whole new, new gambit. Well, one thing that, that's always easy to see looking back is that when we predict what the future will be, we invariably get it wrong because what, what comes up are things we can't imagine. Uh, the, the great American philosopher Yogi Berra, and I say that tongue-in-cheek, of course, he said uh, the hardest thing to predict is the future. And that, that's, he's been proven to be true there. So um, looking back uh, at predictions of the future, we see larger uh, things, things that we have but larger or faster or somehow, you know, nobody imagined microchips and computers running everything uh, because we didn't have the capability. In this sense, artists have kind of led the way in 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 many different ways, imagining for us uh, what the what Saturn would look like from its moon Titan, as Chesley Bonstell did for for many of us who grew up with 1950s science fiction and his great art, and he didn't exactly have it right. Uh, in fact, in many cases, he, he had it quite wrong, but it, it took our imaginations out there. And so artists are always, maybe by definition, a little bit ahead of the curve uh, on the, the leading front for us. And I don't, uh, I, I, I don't think uh, this will ever end, and thankfully it won't ever end. We, we always want the artist to be our imagination for us, not only bring us new ways of seeing things, but imagining uh, things outside of our own sphere.
And uh, so we've gone uh, well over time, but it's been a, a great discussion. And uh, you know, I'd like to to wrap up. Uh, does anybody have some final thoughts they'd like to add? I'd well, just like to thank uh, Astronomers Without Borders for doing this. Um, you know, Earth, the activity of Earth, Earth, Earth is part of space exploration and astronomy, and so uh, hopefully you will do this in future years. Well, I, I'd like to add that we will have more Google Hangouts for the rest of this month. This is Global Astronomy Month, and we will have more of these. Uh, so this will be continued during this month, but I'd also like to point out that Global Astronomy Month is not the end of it. Astronomers Without 